Economics, which is part of the University of Toulouse Capital and is one of the leading centers for economics research in the world, having among its faculty the 2014 Nobel Prize laureate Jean Tirole. This event is being broadcast on Facebook and will be available on YouTube. And there are some participants joining in from Zoom. Uh, let me start by introducing our three guests for this afternoon. First one is François Cabaret on my right. He is an engineer and has held multiple positions at Airbus. He's currently the head of global market forecast, and he will be sharing his own views about climate policy and what's new on the technology front. Welcome. Joining us from Potsdam uh, in Germany, we have Otma Edenhofer on Zoom. Otma is an economist, has written extensively on climate change, has advised the German government and co-chaired a working group on climate change mitigation for the IPCC. He currently directs the Mercator Research Institute on Co Global Commons and the Climate Change and, and the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. And finally, on my left, we have Christian Gaulier, who is an economist, who has also written extensively on climate change. He is also an active voice in the European public debate on climate change. He's the author of Le Climat Après la Fin du Mois, it, and he is the director of Toulouse School of Economics. We'll start for, with some questions for our speakers, and then we'll take questions from the audience and questions from Zoom as well. So people who are watching us from Zoom can type their questions on the chat, and they'll be read out loud in the auditorium. So Christian, if you don't mind, I'll start with you. So this year, the president of the commission has unveiled a package of legislative proposals called Fifth for, Fifth, Fit for 55, which is a package to meet the 55% reductions in emissions, which is the goal of the European Commission. And this package includes many provisions like a new trading scheme and a border adjustment tax for imports. So I'd like to get your view on your impressions of what are the hits and misses of this proposal by the European Commission. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pio. Let me first say that 55% uh, uh, reduction by the year 2030 is, is a challenge. It's, it's an enormous challenge, and I, I'm not sure that everybody understands that. Uh, so so it's 55% it's compared to 1990. Uh, over the last 30 years, the first 30 years of this 40 years uh, time, time span, uh, we did 22%. So we need to do basically double that in one third of the time. So, so it's, it's, it's enormous. Uh, so if you also look at the other region of the world, Europe is a place where it seems that politicians take the issue seriously. Okay, I, my, my evaluation of the current situation in, around the world is Europe with, with this fit for 55, if, if implemented, and, and, and I will say a few words about my, my uncertainty associated to that. If this is implemented, I think this means that Europe takes, takes the issue very seriously. Uh, so this fit for 55 is ambitious, and it's, it's a credible package uh, going in the right direction. Uh, but we must realize that the fit for 55 package is also, uh, uh, I mean, contains a lot of issues uh, of, uh, that, that will be conflictual in the next few months. Um, so, so I'm globally pessimistic, in particular here in France, uh, the issue is not simple, it's not very clear. It's not clear whether the French government will support uh, the, the, the package or not. Let me say one thing. I, I think the, uh, the commission should make clear that because we already committed on the 55%, okay, it should be clear that any member state which would be against one important package of the Fit for 55 package, they, that member should propose an alternative with the same, with the same uh, uh, impact on emission. Okay? Otherwise, if you say, oh, no, I don't like this, uh, <laughs> uh, but, but you don't propose something else which generates equivalent emission reduction, 
Well, uh, it's a simple game that uh, we can imagine what will be the outcome. And for example, the French government, uh, right after uh, the uh, announcement by the Commission on, on July the 14th, uh, different members of the government said, uh, you know, yeah, this, this second ETS, you know, this second market for, for uh, transport and, and residential, we don't like that. <laughs> and, uh, and when I ask them why you don't like that, they don't like that because we have the yellow vest movement. And, uh, and so taxing, taxing uh, fuel for transportation or, or heating is, um, is uh, remain an issue. But, but it, must be clear, it must be clear that any alternative will also be costly. Uh, and, and even probably more costly than, than the pricing, pricing carbon. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, let, let me focus on, on the, 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 main, the main element of the package. I mean, you have many thousand pages for the package, so, so obviously in two minutes I cannot cover everything. Let me focus on the main, the main dimension. So ETS1, so we, we will expand the current uh, European training scheme, which is currently only about industry and, um, and electricity. Uh, we will expand that when partly uh, transportation, aviation. Uh, so, so they will expand that in one direction, specifically because we switch from 40% to 55% reduction. Of, obviously, we need to speed uh, the, the reduction. So we will go, reduce, we will reduce, the, I mean, the, the commission will reduce the uh, the allowance, the distribution, the, the auctioning of allowances from 22%, from 2.2% to 4.2%. So, and there will be an extension to maritime, to the maritime and aviation sector. I don't, I don't go into the detail. The aviation is already there, but, but they get, uh, they get uh, free allowances. Uh, also, because there is this uh, second, second element of the package, which is the carb this carbon border adjustment. Uh, the idea is in order to fight carbon leakage and, and environmental dumping. Over the last 15 years, the Commission offered free allowances to, P, to sectors that were the most uh, sen sensitive to international competition. Aviation is a perfect example. Um, uh, so they got free allowances. The idea is to replace those free allowances by, by taxing any goods and services uh, that contains uh, carbon or that generated carbon emission uh, for their production. So, so, so that's, that's a good idea. And of, of course, that, that raised a lot of issues related to whether we will be able to account for those emissions that are outside the union. It's already quite complex to evaluate emissions inside the, inside the region, but how can we compute or estimate emissions from China, from a good produce in China? That may be quite difficult and challenging, and so, therefore it will take 10 years to expand this uh, carbon border adjustment mechanism. Uh, one difficulty I have uh, with, the, with this ETS-1 is uh, there is no mechanism for a price floor. One of the big things we have seen over the last, uh, the, first, the first 15 years of this, the system is there is a lot of volatility in the carbon price, and therefore uh, it's very hard for, uh, for the private sector to make estimation what will be the cost in the future if I retain my current carbon intensive technology. And of course, in most, when you see, uh, when you examine the actions to reduce emission today, the most important actions are related to investment and investment with long maturity. So for example, when you, when, if you decide to replace your car uh, by an electric car, you will use this electric car for maybe 10 or 15 years, and it's not the current price of carbon that matters for your decision. It's really the carbon prices are in 10 and 15 years from now that will trigger this decision to invest in your electric car. Same thing for, uh, you know, most of the electricity sector. I mean, whether you will replace a, a coal, a, a, a electricity generated by coal, by a windmill, uh, of course, because this investment will last for 30 years, it's the, the price of carbon for the next 40 years that matters. And we, if we have this such large uncertainty about what will be the future price, those, those, this economic transition, this psychological transition will, will be delayed because people will not dare to take that risk. So 
and so this is completely inefficient. So we, so we need to reduce the uncertainty related to uh, the carbon price that is generated by a, a market mechanism rather than a tax. For a tax, it's simple. I mean, it's easier to say we have a price, uh, a tax of 60 euros today, and it will grow for four, by 4% four for the next 20, per year for the next 20 years. That's, that's if you are credible in, your, in that policy, that's, that's that's easier. So so the problem is there is no there is the package do not contain anything to reduce uncertainty, and that's uh, I feel uh, it's a, it's a big problem. So there is also this second market that will be established. So, so economists have been strong in pushing the idea for a unique carbon price in Europe. Any emitters of CO2 should pay the same price because it generates the same damage. And so the Pigovian approach they, they, in order to force people to internalize the, 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 the consequence of their emission on, on the well, on welfare, they should pay for the price, for the, for the damage. And so all emitters should be at the same price. And so the, the simpler, the, the idea was before this announcement as well, let us expand the ETS system to include all emission. Well, for different reasons, the commission didn't want to do that. One of them is the current price on the ETS is very large. It's six, I mean, relatively large. It's 60 euros per ton of CO2. And so for many countries where there has not been any pricing of carbon in those sectors, going from a price of zero to a price of 60 euros, it's a big deal. Uh, for France, it's not a big deal because we already have a carbon tax of 44 euros per ton of CO2. It's still there in spite of the, of the yellow vest movement. movement. Remember, we just which Macron just froze the, 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 the tax. So it's still there. And so we should, we would just switch from that tax to the European mechanism. It should not be too costly for the, for the yellow vest in particular. But, but so, so the idea is to establish a second market. The, well, I understand the reason, political acceptability. The difficulty is the current proposal does not say anything about the convergence of the price. So we, for, a, for some time in Europe, we will have two prices, the price on the first ETS, the historical ETS, and the price of carbon for the new system covering transportation and, 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 um, and residential. And, and keep in mind, it's quite a surprise. So for example, if I heat my house with electricity, I will be the price from the historical ETS. If I, if I uh, heat my house with the with with uh, with natural gas, I will pay the price of the new of the other market. So so that will introduce some some inefficiency, of course. Okay. Yes, I'm done. No, thank you very much. Uh, so let's see if uh, Otmar has a more positive view on the energy parts of fifth or fifty five. Thanks for your criticism, Christian. So let me turn you to you, Otmar, and talk about the energy aspect of these proposals. So one of the main uh, part of the energy legislative proposal is to increase the targets for renewables, right? So I'd like to know if you, you think that's the way to go and if you have also some critical thoughts about 50 or 55 in this regard. Yeah, thanks. Um, let, let me start with an, with an observation. So we have now increasing gas prices in particular after COVID. And unfortunately, the gas price um, is increasing much sharper than the coal price. So around the globe, we see now again what happened over the last 10 years, almost in, in most of the, uh, in, in, many, in many parts of the world, in particular in Southeast Asia, but also in Germany, and this is the renaissance of coal. And this is something which is a big, big issue. And uh, the, so, to, 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 to start on a, on a positive note here on, on the German, uh, on, the, on the European emission trading scheme, even in a, if the cap, the emission cap is well defined, so even the gas price, which increases sharper than the coal price, so will not lead to a, 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 a renaissance of coal again because the CO2 price is then increasing and pushes coal out of the system. This is exactly what we see currently in the German market. Uh, we see uh, because of 63 euros per ton CO2, it is no, no longer competitive to, to rely on, on, on coal. You phase out coal, 
We, rely, we will rely more on gas, of course. Uh, the soaring gas prices create temporary problems. So in Germany, we, 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 we have to blame ourselves because uh, we haven't uh, uh, created enough uh, sufficient buffer capacity for gas. This is something which was a, a, a failure because in, in Germany, we are not very good in taking into account the security issues, the energy security issues. But in principle, this can be solved. And there is absolutely no reason to recommend to the politicians now to intervene into the emission market. And this is uh, what, what is discussed around Europe because of the increasing gas price. People are now discussing uh, we should intervene into the emission uh, trading market. And I hope that the politicians can resist to do this because this would be a complete disaster. Now, I, I, I agree on, on most issues um, Christian has highlighted, but, but let, me, uh, let me say uh, two aspects here. Um, now we have the, the first emission trading scheme, which consists of industry and the power sector, and the CO2 price is increasing, and this will lead to a transformation of the European energy system, by the way, not only in Germany, but also in Poland. Now, the Commission has proposed a second emission trading scheme, and this resembles what we have done in Germany. We have introduced an upstream system, which is then fundamentally a, a, a trading scheme for transport and buildings. And these are two systems. And obviously, these two systems, from a purely economic point of view, are inefficient because you have different prices. But the reason why we have two different systems is simply that industry and the power sector wouldn't agree to reduce the emissions according to cost efficiency. The cost efficiency would imply that the power and industry sector would have to reduce emissions by 80%. They, they will not accept this, neither in Germany nor in, 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 in at the European level. But then we have, uh, and I fully agree, we would need uh, in the package a clear indication how the convergence process should look like. And I agree very much with Christian when he says we need a price floor. And this is, from my point of view, absolutely necessary because um, if the Commission wants to have two separate systems with two different prices, so then we need two different price flows. If this is not the case without the price floor, we will see immediately on the market a convergence of the price very quickly. And, and this is completely irrespective if you have two different systems from a legal point of view, because traders in the market will, will use uh, the, uh, the arbitrage. And if they expect that there will be a convergence after 2030, they will go on the market and, and then we will see a rapid uh, convergence of the price. So the price floor, and this might be the unintended consequences of the EU proposal, we might see. Uh, uh, two price floors, but then again, it is absolutely crucial uh, to have a convergence process. Now, let me highlight one aspect why I'm so concerned when we, we would fail at the European level to implement a second ETS system. What is the alternative to the second ETS system? The alternative is what is called in this uh, typical European acronyms, uh, the European uh, effort sharing regulation. The European effort sharing reg regulation functions as follows. All the member states have obligations to reduce the emissions. And if one member state fails, uh, a member state can buy emissions by another state. It, it, it is not an emissions trading scheme uh, between uh, um, among market agents like, like uh, investors, like consumers. It's a trading scheme among governments. And this trading scheme among governments has absolutely no compliance mechanism because we have already such a system, but the prices uh, on this market are completely hidden and they will not be transparent. And therefore the penalty is no uh, transparent. I believe that the European effort sharing regulation has a very, very weak compliance mechanism. And it is by no means an alternative to a well-defined emission cap, which is decreasing over time. So my, pro my, my, my proposition here is either we will have a, an implemented ETS2, 
And then we have at least an inefficient, but over time we could reduce the efficiency, but we have at least a, re a, re a reasonable compliance mechanism. If we get rid of the second ETS system, we will have not a compliance mechanism at all, at least no credible one. And then I, I have real doubts that we will reduce emissions uh, around minus 55%, and not to mention the big goal in the end, carbon neutrality by 2050. So in, in that sense, I hope that we will see a joint European effort uh, to do this. And I fully agree with Christian, a member state who says, I do not like this, this part of the package, please come up then with a better proposal, which has the same power for, for, for compliance. So in, in, in that sense, I see that ETS-1 and ETS-2 is, is essential. A second component in the, in the 55 proposal is the social fund, which allows to compensate low-income households. I think this is absolutely crucial. And I think Europe will not survive this gas crisis without this compensation mechanism. And the third component are large-scale investment funds around Europe uh, to, 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 to undertake investments in the post-COVID uh, recovery. And I think this investment fund should be used uh, uh, to, 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 to support technologies which, which, um, um, which have a potential for future cost reduction. And this could make the whole, uh, the whole uh, uh, emission trading scheme uh, over the time much more credible. So to conclude, ETS-1, ETS-2 is essential. Work with the social fund and uh, give the investments fund the right direction uh, uh, um, in, 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 in the right direction via the implementation uh, of a, a unique carbon price across all the sectors over time. Thank you very much, Otmar, for your uh, thoughts. Uh, you seem to converge a lot with Christian, especially with regard to the two ETS systems being coexisting. But let's now go to another aspect of Fit for 55 with our third guest. Uh, this proposal has also some provisions for aviation and transportation, has ambitious targets to zero emissions from cars by 2035. So can you give us your view about how the transportation sector will react and is preparing for this? Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. You know, we are making airplanes, not cars. So I won't comment on, on cars. <laughs> Um, can give your opinions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not an economist. I'm an engineer by education. I'm trying to understand economics. Normally, I fail, so I hire people from TSC regularly, and uh, we hope to hire more. Uh, again, so I'm not an economist, but I can. I think with 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 Airbus, I can illustrate uh, how much a company, and not just Airbus as a company, but the air transport industry, industry as an industry is now uh, framed and shaped by environmental policies, which is indeed becoming right at the core of our strategy and not just our long-term strategy, but our day-to-day -day, uh, operation. First, I want to, I want to state that um, we have, I mean, I have an Airbus, we have a, a moral obligation and a legal obligation toward uh, the fight for climate. Uh, it's not just legal, it's also moral. I think uh, Airbus has changed drastically in a matter of a decade, and this is really into our DNA, as, as we would say now. So we have this obligation, but we also have a, a business concern, which is basically, if we don't do anything, we would lose our license, our social license to operate. There is so much legitimate environmental pressure on the industry as a whole, in particular on the aviation sectors for good and bad reason, that if we, don't, if we don't show that we are acting and if we are not acting drastically, not in 10 or 20 years, but now, we would just lose our license to operate. So beyond the moral and legal obligation, we have an existential threat that is there. And just for the sake, I mean, even if you put aside the moral obligation, as as a company driven by business, we would have to change. You might have heard about uh, what is Airbus' view about the different technological steps that we need to implement to reach what we call net zero by 2050. I will, I will say a few things 
um, about that. Um, but indeed, you might have heard that since a few years now, we started collectively, not just Airbus, but the industry, we started to voice our ambition to reach net zero by 2050. 2050 is, um, you know, when I was 20 years old, looking 30 years old away was ridiculous for me. But now I'm getting older and 30 years starts to mean something. 30 years is, I would not say tomorrow, but when you think about industrial cycle and as well policy cycle, I mean, fit for 55 is a, what, a 15 month process until the final adoption. So it's, it's not an overnight process. So 30 years for an industrial company is midterm. It means that if we want to think about what we are going to produce and sell in 2035, 40, 50, we have to start now. Actually, we are spending every year several hundred millions of euro just on research and development expenses so that we are able to build product into, into the market in, in the mid 30s that will be major enabler toward, the, toward the, the, the net zero. So just to come back quickly on, fifth, on the fit for 55, uh, first of all, globally Airbus is very happy with fit for 55 because it's pretty much aligned with our view or what we collectively need to do. And because it's giving a legal framework to some very important pillar of the decarbonization strategy of Airbus, for instance, the sustainable aviation fuel, and for instance, as well, the ETS. What we are, and if you allow me three minutes to explain a bit, what is Airbus view on, on this? So we have a situation today where globally the air transport industry emits a little bit more than 2% of, of, the, of the CO2, 2.2, 2.3, which, which is not huge if you compare it with other sector, but which is significant and which anyway, we need to cut drastically. So we have, a, we have different steps in, into this effort. Uh, the, the first one is that today we have technologies that are available, which is basically the airplane we are producing here in Germany or, or in Blagnac, which allows to reduce carbon emission by give or take 20%. If, if you look at today's fleet, it's only about 12 or 13% of the aircraft that you might be flying from time to time that are from the latest generation. So there are still 88% of the aircraft that we can replace with much more fuel efficient aircraft. It means as well that you quickly understand that something is about money. I mean, you, it's important as well to remind that airlines need to generate some cash flow, some free cash flow, so they can invest into new aircraft that are going to bring to help the decarbonization of the industry. The, the, the next step for the, the, the coming decades, we have two, two avenues. First, is a, there is a, a technological improvement. You might have heard about uh, the hydrogen aircraft, which uh, we aim to bring to the market mid of the next decade. And, and the other big pillar is what is known as sustainable aviation fuel. And here I come back to Fit for 55. It's really great that uh, Fit for 55 has set very clear ambition about the percentage of sustainable aviation fuel that needs to be used with, uh, with uh, different dates. Actually, we think uh, the EU has been a little bit shy. We, we, we think we need to be more ambitious. And what's fascinating is that when you start to talk about sustainable aviation fuel, you, you, you need to understand that everything relies on abundant clean, clean energy. So at the end, whether, I mean, whatever you, the, the, the angle you take to look at the problem, at the foundation, at the basis, you need clean energy in large, in, in large quantity. We try as well to look beyond energy because for some of the fuel, you know, in sustainable aviation fuel, there is basically the biomass uh, sustainable aviation fuel, which is, which is a bit criticized because for biomass, it means that you need land surface, you need water, and so on. There is another technology which I want to mention very quick, quickly because it's, it's very important. It, it is what we call synthetic fuel or e-fuel, which is a way to produce liquid fuel out of uh, uh, hydrogen and uh, carbon directly captured from, from, from the atmosphere. So there are technological solutions. 
at the end, it's about available money to invest and a very good and forward-looking legal frame, which is what Fit for 55 is bringing. So at the moment, we, we really upload to the Fit for 55, and we hope that it can be a little bit more ambitious in some respect, and maybe a little bit less ambitious in other respects that we are not very strong supporter of. But globally, it's a very good framework. Sorry, I've been long. No, that was perfect. And there was uh, one optimistic voice about Fit for 55. Uh, so we are now going to take questions from the audience and from Zoom. But before we start, we have a question for the audience. So we would ask you to answer a little survey, which is you have to go to www.menti.com and put this code and answer, according to you, what will be the main energy of a CO2 neutral future? And as you reply, the answers will start to, to pop up in, in the screen. But we can also start taking the questions from, from you if, you if you have some. So maybe questions from Zoom. But then I, I have a specific question. So you, you mentioned about the, the biofuels. It, it, there is a provision, if I'm not mistaken, to have a 5% goal in biofuel, in, of biofuels in, in airplane. Uh, uh, yeah. In fifth of fuel. Yeah. yeah, in fifth of for fifth. Of, and you, you seem to be very optimistic about the technological constraints, like the, how you can achieve that. So can you elaborate? Yeah, you're right. Uh, th there is a provision. Again, I have a view with that the whole industry needs to be a bit more ambitious than the provision, because we would potentially fall short about uh, what's needed to decarbonize the, the, the industry. So yes, there are, you, you know, biomass fuel, they have a very bad reputation because uh, 10 years ago or 15 years ago, it was about actually using some land in competition with uh, food to produce biofuel for airplane. We, we, we move to different generation. Now, if we do a biomass fuel, that would be from a waste and uh, there should not be any competition. And anyway, we, we know again, to come back to the, uh, the moral obligation and the social pressure, we know that we, we should not and we could not compete with land resource that is used for, uh, that is used for food. I mean, I was traveling recently into a, uh, a country I love, Ethiopia, and we had the, we had those discussions with the, with the, some customers, and we talked about energy needed to produce synthetic fuel. I mean, if you know a little bit about Ethiopia, they have just built their first major hydraulic dam. So they are still some miles away from using their energy, their electricity to produce synthetic fuel. They need first to produce electricity to fulfill the basic needs of their people. So we have to be very careful about the potential competition. And again, I was referring to water, uh, synthetic fuel, you actually use water. So we, we, we need to make sure that, again, this is fair to everyone, not competing to other basic needs. And at the end, we are very much aware that we need, we need very big number in terms of clean energy. So what is now core at the at the at, at, at the, the, the the thinking at Airbus is eventually how we make sure that there is sufficient clean energy for the world and then for aviation. So thank you, François. I think Christian would like to react to something. Uh... Well, maybe you may want first to uh, to comment on, on the uh, on the outcome of the first question. But yes, uh, just uh, well, uh, for, for aviation is certainly the most difficult uh, sector to decarbonize. It will certainly the last sector to decarbonize in reality, because we clearly, I mean, you mentioned the biofuels, of course, and, and we know that biofuels are, have a dif difficulty in particular competition with, with food production. Um, but, but look, all, all uh, renewable sources of energy are, are Currently, with the bad, bad, uh, bad advertisements. So, so look at uh, wind, wind electricity. Now in France, nobody wants, nobody wants that. Nuclear, don't think about that. So, so uh, we are, we are in a very, very difficult situation. We know for sure that in the short run, if we want to be credible in Europe, we just 
we should start with eliminating coal from the electricity power uh, because it, it costs something like 30 euros or 40, 40 euros per ton of CO2 saved to switch from coal to, to natural gas. Natural gas is not the end of the story, of course, because it's also a carbonized source of energy. But, but compared to the incredible cost of removing carbon from aviation, I mean, it, it would make no sense to ask the aviation to do already something today when we don't, which will be, it would cost maybe 1,000 or 2,000 euros per tons of CO2 save. It makes no sense. And at the same time, we need aviation. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, transatlantic flight, <laughs> we need that for, I mean, many, in many, in many profession, it's a necessity. So, so, so yes, it's very challenging. Thank you, Christian. So let me comment on the survey and go to Otmar. So the, our respondents seem to be very optimistic about solar as being the main energy solution for a CO2 neutral future. Eight people for nuclear, eight for hydrogen, five for wind, and only one believing that you know, carbon capture will solve the problem. So you no. Know, do you want to comment a bit on the survey and give your own take, Otmar, or even react to what Christian has just said about sector-specific targets? Yeah, so thanks. Um, first of all, I, I, I very much agree on the importance of, of synthetic fuels. So we did a calculation, and so the, the current the price for producing synthetic fuels is roughly 500 euros per ton CO2. I'm not so pessimistic like Christian, but still 500 euros per ton CO2 is a, is a very high price. We expect uh, over the next two decades uh, a decline in, in, in the costs. So we might end up so with, with 200 euros per ton CO2. And here I would say in the production of synthetic fuels, this is a, a good example where let's say contract for difference could work where basically um, the difference between the current CO2 price and, and, and the, the price in the, in the ETS, this could be supported by, by the government in order to, uh, to incentivize the development of, of, of these technologies. Um, what I would like to highlight here, and, and this is equally important because um, uh, uh, Francois mentioned this, um, and this is, this is direct air capture. I, I don't believe synthetic fuels, we can rely on biomass, though there's, this is not a, the potential is not sufficient. We need direct air capture. And we need direct air capture not only for synthetic fuels, we need direct air capture also to create negative emissions because not all the emissions can be reduced. Process emissions from industry is a good example. And therefore, we need negative emissions. In order to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050, negative emission technologies are incredibly important. And uh, the problem is that, that we need pilot projects for this. And we need investments now to do this because uh, this technology should be available uh, in, in, in the next, in the next uh, two decades. And therefore, we need a lot of uh, R&D investment, a, a lot of pilot projects here. And, and, and this is an, an important component when we talk about carbon neutrality, which means basically fundamentally a greenhouse gas neutrality. Uh, this is a net, which means net neutrality, net zero. This means that we need to, to a significant amount uh, uh, negative emissions. So this is another area where we need uh, R&D, where we need uh, much more uh, investment. So, and I'm a little bit concerned that uh, this involves then definitely also carbon capture and storage. I know that, in, but I don't know exactly the situation in France, but in Germany, a carbon capture and storage is, 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 is not very popular. Um, fortunately, I have to say that the Norwegians, they basically will offer Europe their uh, uh, storage sites, uh, of course, for a reasonable price. But, but uh, this confirms that for all uh, this um, pathway, this transformation pathway, we need indeed a cooperation among all the European uh, member states. And, uh, but also we have to talk about technologies which are less popular than, than, than solar power and carbon capture and storage is, a, is an example. And we, we need carbon capture and storage, not so much for postponing the phase out of coal, 
We need carbon capture for producing, uh, uh, or we absorb C, uh, CO2 from the atmosphere. Otherwise, uh, a greenhouse gas neutrality would be not feasible. Okay, thank you. So let me come back to Christian for a sec. Let's just see, are there questions from Zoom or? Yeah? Okay. So why should society make the decision to allocate biofuels to certain some sectors and not to others? Yeah, yeah. That, that's a very good question. Both I mean, of you uh, can, uh, yeah, the, the, I mean, there is a lot of uncertainty about what will be the marginal abatement cost for different sectors at different time. Um, when you look at the, the model, the kind of model that Otmar and colleagues are doing in order to estimate what is the optimal uh, road to zero zero net emission, uh, and what are what will be the marginal abatement cost for different sectors and different technologies? Uh, and we are we, there are many bets in there, uh, uh, and, and when you compare the models across uh, different uh, groups of researchers who have tried to to make that kind of computation, you see an enormous uh, size of uncertainty. Uh, we don't know whether in 2050 we will have a, we will a, a, a carbon price of uh, 1,000 euros per ton of CO2 of, or 100 euros per ton of CO2 will be necessary to get there. Um, and so that's, that's an illustration of the intensity of the uncertainty we face, not only us, the planner, but much, much more the the people who are doing the investment today. Okay, so this, so this uncertainty is, is extreme. And, and Otmar presented a very nice paper this morning at the, at the seminar of the, uh, on, on environmental economics on that issue, looking at to, how to incentivize people, investors to do this effort, whether it should be uh, a future carbon price or whether it should be uh, subsidies today. Uh, well, those models are very interesting and, 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 and we work on that. The point is, the point I want to make here again is, um, and that's related to the question, I, I realize that I'm quite far from answering that question at this stage, but, but uh, so this uncertainty is big. It's clear, it's clear that aviation, uh, given the, the context and the fact that you have to fly with the energy in order to attain the objective, compared to an electric car where you can get, have a quite an heavy battery in your car and it still be able to move. For the aviation, it's not possible. Uh, and, and batteries are very, 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 very heavy, uh, quite costly. And on top of that, the quantity of energy you can transport with that battery uh, by kilogram is much less than a, a, ki a kilogram of kerosene. Uh, so, so, uh, so this, the technological uh, uh, challenge is big. Hydrogen could be a solution. I'm surprised you didn't say a word about hydrogen, uh, but we don't know. But clearly, there is a lot of demand. There, is, there are many sectors having in mind uh, uh, biofuels or biogas as a solution, and clearly they will not in they will not be enough of such uh, of such um, uh, energy available from that technology to satisfy the supply. So clearly, it will be difficult, and and of course those sectors that have the most difficulty. Uh, to at, attain zero uh, zero net emission uh, will 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 bet for, I mean will will uh, uh, will will get uh, will get the, this this source of energy at the large price and I think aviation is likely to be there. Would you like to react a bit to that? Or? Yeah, maybe quickly for for the question. Uh, the question is, is great, and for me the answer is. Uh, biomass based fuel that actually compete with food should not be allowed it's a political decision and 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 i think it's both a moral and again a legal uh, uh, obligation for all of us but back to your i mean i like very much the question because you know i've got live lead I, i'm the, i'm the father of three z generations so i have very lively dinner every day at home and um, and fight and so i'm telling my kid that first point is uh, uh, become a vegetarian 
which is actually the most efficient to fight climate change for all of us today. And, and then the question is, should we be forced to become vegetarian? That would be the most efficient legislative decision with, with almost an immediate effect, one year. And so it, it's, a, it's always a mix of individual behavior and political decision. Back to your question about uh, aviation fuel, I think it's a political decision. But I think every day when we wake up in the morning, we should remind us what is the behavior I'm going to change today and then tomorrow for, for the climate question. But, but Francois, just to dig a little bit deeper, you seem to be overall positive about the targets of 50 or 55, but the idea of having restrictions like biofuel in, in airplane fuels, you don't seem to be so positive about that, right? And whereas the economists seem to be also a bit skeptical about the costs that this might have, like if aviation is really yeah, the sector true, that true, should be true. targeted. For this. Now, uh, back to your point, you're right. I mean, aviation is very expensive to decarbonize. For instance, the uh, uh, electrical aircraft, I mean, electrical car is pretty easy. It, it's there. It's massively there. Uh, electrical aircraft, so far, it works for very small aircraft, very short distance. Maybe in 10, 15 years, you can go from Toulouse to Narbonne for the weekend with an electrical aircraft, but it's not there. And synthetic fuel, they are five to 10 times more expensive than that fuel. So yes, it is probably the most technologically challenging sector to decarbonize. Yes, it is uh, probably the more expensive. But again, because you are so much under the spotlight that, I mean, pragmatically, probably from an economist point of view, you would decarbonize, you, will, you would first switch off the, all the coal energy plant in Germany and then switch off the gas and so on. So it might be seen as non-rational, and, and I can hear that. But again, for us, it's an existential threat. We, we, we need to change completely the way we operate. Otherwise, you will stop flying, and, and you might be right to do so. So there is a, this fundamental issue to address for us. OK. Uh, would you like to add something to that? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, the, the, the price of carbon uh, that will be necessary to attain zero net emission is a key question for most sectors. Aviation is an example, but all other examples are, are still struggling about what, what's the intensity of the problem. Let, let, me, let me look at the special case of drivers. I mean, you and, you, you, you and I, we have a car and we think about switching to electric car. Um, so currently, the, the carbon tax is 44 euros per ton of CO2. That corresponds to 10 cents per liter. So that's, that's the current price. That's the current delta price you pay for contributing I mean, to incentivize you to reduce your, your emission. Um, that's for with 44 euros. If we go to 200 or 300 euros per ton of CO2 by the year 2030 to go to 55 percent reduction of CO2 globally, that's we think. I mean, uh, we economists in France we have a report by, by uh, Alain Kinet from uh, that has been required by the government that estimate this price of carbon around 300 euros per ton of CO2. So, so that would increase your liter of gasoline at the pump around you know, something like 60, 70 cents per liter. So uh, that's, that gives you the idea of where we have to go. Okay? And, and compared to the current situation the, with the increase of uh, the, 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 the oil, oil price on the international market or the price of uh, natural gas on the market, on natural gas, we have seen the price multiplied by a factor of four, so 400 person within the last six months or nine months. Okay, so, so the shock is much stronger. I mean, the increase in the price of natural gas or the increase in price of, uh, of the, the gasoline and the pump has been much, much larger than what we have to do in order to get uh, to zero emission 
uh, by the year 2050. So, so we have, in order to increase this price, we have 10 years or we have 30 years to go. So it, just to say, this price, this price, the, many economists say, oh, that's good to have an increase in those price of natural gas or the price of gasoline at the pump because that's incentivized people to reduce their emission without having to require a carbon price. The carbon price we have in mind is much smoother. And we don't want to have such a shock. Huh? Carbon pricing would be much smoother. We will gradually increase the carbon price to get to incentivize people to reduce their emission. That's true for transportation by car. It should also be true for aviation. OK. Otmar, would you like to? Yeah. So I, I think that we have an agreement among the panelists that that carbon pricing is 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 a is a, is a good thing to do. The problem is, um, can investors and consumers trust that the politicians will stick either to the carbon budget or to the carbon price? And and from my point of view, the whole debate, uh, at least with in Germany with environmental groups, boils down to the question: uh, Do we believe that? there is a credible commitment for policymakers. Are policymakers capable to, 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 to a, a credible commitment? If there's a credible commitment, so you see an increasing smooth carbon price. And if you know that the carbon price is increasing, of course, you would invest then in synthetic fuels. You would invest in all these things. And uh, Christian and myself, we would agree even on the risk premium. And we would have to say, okay, uh, there's a growth of 3%. Then there is no problem because with 3% discount rate, it would be even currently in Germany uh, profitable to switch from a, an, a combustion engine to an electric car. But if there is no credible commitment, the, the risk premium will increase from 3 to 6%. And then basically there is no longer uh, a, 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 a profitable investment in electric cars. So in that sense, this is, this is the crucial thing. And, and how can we solve this commitment problem? And I think this is at the, at, at the core. And I understand what I understand that most people who oppose carbon pricing, and there are a lot of people who are opposing uh, carbon pricing now, don't believe on this, on this commitment device. They might express it in a different language, but, but this is the logic of the argument. And therefore, I think um, we need we need to think about this. And my proposal would be to delegate some of the task to be responsible. So the decision about the available carbon budget is a, a political uh, decision. Uh, how, how, to what extent low income households should be supported? This is a distributional issue. Just, this should be taken by policymakers. But managing the carbon budget, introducing a, a minimum price, uh, uh, creating an, uh, auctions for negative uh, emissions. This is something which a European uh, climate or carbon bank could do. And, and I think this would be the way because then the, the, the commitment would be, would be much more credible. So that, that's, that's basically my, my conclusion here. And this is the, the, the biggest uh, the challenge which is ahead of us. Thank you, Otmar. Let's just see if we have one quick question to finish, but otherwise we will leave some uh, concluding remarks to our speakers. Yeah, maybe ju just to 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 follow up on uh, what Otmar was telling. Uh, indeed, we need very clear legal framework, not just for the next legislation, but but for the next thirty years. And just a reminder that. Since the beginning, we have been talking about FIFA 455, which is what 10% of the world population and maybe 50% of the emission. So uh, we should not remain into our bubble. That's why I think the aviation industry relies on European policies, especially because European policies on this topic is really on the front line and somehow is a uh, setting standards, standards which I hope will spread. But as well for the aviation industry, it's, uh, it's as well not just about political uh, support, but as well about collective um, uh, decision across industry or the airline. You might have heard about two important associations, IATA 
and OACI, which are basically the, 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 the syndicat des transports aériens. And, and th those institutions, which are worldwide, have committed toward net zero. So it's not just in Europe, but it's as well across all continents, including in, in India and China. So, so whenever we are talking about technological solution or legal framework, we should not forget that it's a worldwide issue that we have to tackle. Well, uh, first, thank you for the invitation. I mean, I, I'm very happy to see both Germany and France uh, on the same line, not only uh, economists here in the room, and, but most economists I, I meet and I know in, in France and, and in Germany uh, agree on, on what's, what's, what's the politi policy instrument to, to uh, realize the commitment made by the politicians to go to zero uh, net emission by the year 2050. It's also good to see that uh, the, the most, the most well-known uh, corporation in Europe, uh, Franco German, Airbus, uh, agreeing with the, with the target and agreeing that uh, uh, they, they will contribute to the solution. How, how we will be able to do that? Nobody knows, nobody has an idea, but what will be, how, how the European economy will look like in 2050 uh, fully decarbonized. Um, but but, but we, I'm happy to see we work on that. I'm happy, I'm very happy that we are contributing to, to the debate and we are supporting the Fit for 55, which is, a, again, it's a courageous and credible strategy to get there. And again, I'm happy to see that Europe is moving in that direction of providing a solution, providing a strategy. Uh, and I hope that in Glasgow next month, we will see other regions of the world doing something similar. I don't see that currently in, in the US, but I hope that uh, by the, the Biden administration will move. And I heard recently that they could eventually decide to go for carbon pricing. Let's, let's look at what will happen soon. Thank you so much, Christian. Otmar, would you like to have some concluding words? Or? Uh, I uh, I would say I'm I'm I don't want to come across as as pessimistic. I, I see a lot of challenges, and uh, I'm also happy to see that there is a lot of convergence not only among uh, professional economists but also between uh, industry. And I, I would even say uh, uh, that industry is is much more progressive now than than the policymakers. And industry is expecting from the policy from the policymakers a credible regulatory framework, and this is this is missing now. And I think um, I hope that uh, the European debate on the two ETS will succeed in the end with the support of of France and and Germany here. So there we have to join forces here. And uh, when 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 France and Germany join the forces here, I'm. I, I would be incredibly optimistic. Thank you so much. Francois, would you like to conclude with some? <laughs> no, no, what you're describing is a uh, Airbus uh, story. You know, uh, this is where, uh, this is where uh, France and Germany, uh, only a few years after the end of uh, World War II, started to cooperate actively. Okay, there was, there was a, the, the, the Charbon et l'Acier first, I think in 54, but Rapidly after that, uh, Airbus came. And, and just the anecdote is maybe um, if you visit the, the, the big Airbus factory in Hamburg, uh, actually you see the hangar where during World War II they were building the airplane to fight the French. And now we are building the same Airbus together on those factories. So it's quite of a, it's a, it's a nice symbol. Thank you very much. So it's good to conclude this event with a celebration of Franco-German friendship. Uh, thank you <laughs> in English, yes, <laughs> it's very European. Uh, so I'd like to thank very much our speakers, Francois Cabaret, Otmar Edenhofer, and Christian Gaulier, if we can applaud them. <laughs> and also there, organizers of the event, the communications team of TSC and the Franco-German fortnight in Occitania. Have a nice evening, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you, Edmar. That was very nice to spend uh, the whole day with you. <laughs>
Thanks, Christian. It was great.